All right, scorpions. Um, scorpions are um, also members of Arachnida, but they're in order Scorpionida. And scorpions, let's talk about the attributes here. We got um, the four walking legs. We have the chelicerae. And look at the chelicerae here. They're pinchers. They're not hollow fangs. They're actually pinchers, which is, which is kind of disturbing. They have two weird little eyes here. And then these giant pinchers are the pedipalps. And then they have uh, they don't have a pedicel so they have a cephalothorax here they are missing a pedicel like in Irenaeans they have an abdomen and then they have a post abdomen with a stinging tail scorpions are some of the strangest looking um, looking creatures on the planet um, all these different attributes from the eyes to the pinching mouth parts to the giant claws to the abdomen with a stinger at the end with some really potent um, venom sometimes. Very strange animals. A lot of these are uh, desert environments, um, so live in desert environments. And they, um, the best way to find these is to go out at night. They're mostly nocturnal um, and shine a, a high powered UV light around. And, and for some reason, we don't know precisely why, but the, the exoskeleton of scorpions will often glows blue or green under UV light. And so um, they're pretty easy to find if you go out in the t into a desert at night. They use the little pinchers for subduing prey and then will usually um, stab their prey with their venom and then munch it up with their chelicerae. So these are all predators. You're not gonna eat plants with those, those features. And here is one cleaning its pedipalps and I want you to watch the chelicerae that come out right here. And you can see their little pictures. Very strange, very uncomfortable. Um, yeah, strange creatures. Those are scorpions. Scorpions make, um, even though they're very strange, one thing that we do have in common with them is that they take care of their young. So here is a pile of baby scorpions on top of their mama, and she will care for them and provide food and protection for them until they're old enough to fend for themselves, and then they better leave or she will eat them. Um, so good mama for a little while and then uh, dangerous mama. So maternal care in scorpions um, for a, a time at least. You know, take what you can get. So fugids are interesting animals. You, they're kind of scorpion-like, kind of um, uh, spider-like, and so they're, they're, in the, they're in their own group. And look at the attributes. They kind of have a pedicel like spiders, so they have a cephalothorax and an abdomen. It's not quite as distinct as it is on spiders, though. You have one, two, three, four legs, which would make these the pedipalps, and these the chelicerae. And then these, the weird scorpion-like eyes. The chelicerae are kind of scorpion-like as well because they're pinchers, but they're dorsoventrally opposed rather than laterally opposed. And um, it looked like the scorpion, um, the scorpion chelicerae were kind of rotatable. They could they could rotate them and flex them in different um, um, orientations. But the chelicerae of the camel spider is just straight up and down. These guys also don't have venom at all, either in, on their fronts or their tails, and they use their um, their massive mandible uh, chelicerae, sorry, uh, their massive chelicerae to subdue their prey immediately. They're really quick runners and they're active predators. They live in desert environments and they're they're nocturnal, similar to scorpions, and they're they're rapid hunting uh, pursuit predators. So these are not ambush predators; they're pursuit predators. So they're very fast, and when they get their prey, they just munch them up with their big chelicerae. Opiliones is another interesting um, group, and um, here, how do we distinguish Opiliones from Irenaeans? They don't have a pedicel, so Opiliones just have kind of what looks like a single body segment, but they have one, two, three, four walking legs, pedipalps, and then chelicerae. The pedipalps in these are again highly, highly diff, diver, uh, diverse in the different groups. Some are used for um, uh, communicating to mates. Um, some are used for catch, catching prey, and so very, very interesting animals. They're mostly diverse in the tropics. We saw this thing on the outside of our habitat, and we poked it. 
thinking it was some type of plant growth, but it was not a plant growth. It was a whole bunch of these opilionies. Some of us have taken to calling these little creatures um, daddy long legs, and they're pretty common. And uh, some of the, the crewless members of our crew think it's quite funny to take off all the, all the legs of these opilionies, and if you remove all their legs, it's just thump. It's just, it's just, it's just a sad little body that, that can't move. Um, I would never do that, of course, um, but um, I've, I, I've seen it done by, um, by the unfeeling members of our crew. And it's just a sad little body of a, of a, of a opilionis. Now, these are not spiders, right? They have a single body segment. They have eight legs, uh, but they're not spiders. They are, um, common name is harvestmen. And harvestmen, some people think they have incredibly toxic venom, but they don't really have uh, very toxic venom at all. Um, some of them are slightly venomous, but it's, it's not very dangerous. They do have a really interesting trait called autotomy, and so um, one way, uh, these long spindly legs, they actually release them fairly easily by themselves. So autotomy is the intentional release of um, a limb of your own for protection. So if a predator grabs a leg, they just shed the leg and, you know, amble off on the other seven. So it's better to lose one leg than it is to lose your whole self. So that's autotomy, the intentional loss of a limb for um saving the rest of your body. Now uh, look at this structure, uh, this daddy long legs versus this one. These are both opilionies. They have the same attributes, but they're just very different. So that's what I was saying about the, the diversity of forms in, in this group. This was um, this is an active predator, a neotropical species, and uh, almost can see kind of a hard, hardened carapace um, and extensive ornamentation, a very interesting um, species for sure. So these are very diverse in the tropics, um, but we don't have a great collection of them yet. Uh, the most common ones around here are uh, look like this, little daddy long legs. Here is one of my favorite species. Um, this one, if you kind of have the eyes of face, you can see little ears and little eyes, little nose. This is a little, uh, called the bunny harvestman or maybe a, a dog harvestman. Very, uh, very interesting. I don't know why it is the way it is, but it is the way it is. The last ones we need to talk about are, are in order Akari, and we they, this includes the ticks and the mites. This uh, The ticks are parasitic, and ticks, uh, nobody really likes ticks, and unlike spiders, I think even if you got to know ticks, the, the repulsion still persists. Um, we don't need to judge a book by its cover, but the inside of this book is full of blood. So here is a, a, a tick that is fed. It feeds off of blood um, of mammals and um, birds, uh, some reptiles too, but the ones we're mostly concerned are, are with are the ones that attack us. They have a capitulum, which is their kind of their head over here, and the capitulum includes a piercing, stabbing mouth part, and they stab that little guy into flesh. And then, um, so here, we've got pedipalps, legs and then the chelicerae are part of the, the capitulum and so they stab that in and then they secrete a really strong glue that just firmly adheres them to their host so even a firm brush or scrape with a with a paw won't get them off and then they just fill their bodies up with um, with blood so look at the difference between the size of the abdomen here and the size of the abdomen here compared to um, their little dorsal plate here so they eat, will really eat um, basically three blood meals in their life, and each blood meal pr um, provides enough energy for them to molt and grow to their next stage. So they really only usually have three hosts during their life, <clears throat> depending on the species, and then they lay eggs and die. They also transmit a lot of diseases. Um, so also actually before I, I want to point out that if you were to grab the tick by the abdomen and squeeze, to pull, try to pull them off your body, all you're doing is pushing all the guts and everything into your own body. You have to grab him at the capitulum to pull him out of your body. So little tweezers is important. Don't just grab him and squeeze all his guts into your guts. That's not a, not a great way to live. Some of them transmit a really nasty bacteria that cause disease in humans. This is a characteristic rash of Lyme disease, um, and this is called the bullseye or target rash. 
And so the, it, can, it doesn't form where the tick bites, um, actually. It can form anywhere on the body. And um, this, but this characteristic bullseye type rash indicates that um, you've been bitten by a smooth criminal tick. <laughs> And then the mites, a, these are a very diverse group. Um, a lot of them are parasitic, a lot of them are free living. Um, a lot of them are very, very small. So, so the smallest among all the Chiasrata are mites. Um, some of them are even microscopic. Dust mites cause a lot of allergies. And one common method of um, lifestyle for mites is um, phoresis. So you have phoretic mites that, um, phoresis is a kind of specialized type of parasitism where they're not actually um, using their hosts for food, but they're using them for transport. So these little clusters, these little guys here, those are the mites on top of the beetle. And they just use the beetle to get from one place to another. They're not actually harming the beetle directly except by um, extra weight. Um, so phoresis is like transport parasitism. There's also some um, common ones around here that cause some itching and um, irritation on human skin. We're calling these um, chiggers, and chiggers are larval forms of some mites. And you'll notice that larvae only have six legs, one, two, three, four, five, six. So larval ticks and mites um, only have six legs, which is interesting. But these little chiggers live in tall grass. They're very, very small, and they like to um, drink a little bit of your blood and skin cells. So once they latch on, they secrete a, um, an anticoagulant, and then they make this thing called a stylosome, which is um, they secrete these proteins that basically harden your skin um, so that they can make this empty tube to get to your blood down here. And then they use this little empty tube of your own skin cells, dead skin cells, to slurp up the blood. Um, all the while they're doing this, they're secreting an antihistamine, so your immune system doesn't respond to them. And then once they've had their fill, they will leave, and that, that means the antihistamine stops, which means your immune response recognizing, recognizes that the stylosome is something wrong, and it attacks it. So if you ever are in grass and you come back with little red dots everywhere, they're really itchy, uh, the chiggers are no longer there. They have dropped off and they're long gone, having fled um, from you and fed on you. Um, and what's left is this little stylus stone, um, and it's caused the irritation, but it, it fades with time. So those are the arachnids, a very, very diverse group, very large group, very speciose group. And um, as, I've, as I hope is clear, you should be able to be very good at uh, identifying pedipalps, chelicerae, walking legs, tagmata for all these diverse animals. Last time I shared a little bit of my thoughts about one suspect in Dr. Mastronomer's murder, um, Isabella, and how maybe Isabella had a motive uh, because she was trying to keep her meetings with Charlie um, secret, and Dr. Mastronomer was kind of their go-between. So um, uh, today I'd like to talk about another suspect, Isabella's father. And it's kind of related to this whole secret romantic relationship. Um, in that I don't really see Isabella as having a strong motivation to kill Dr. Mastronomer unless, um, like I said last time, Mastronomer was going to potentially tell a captain about the relationship. But why would that be such a big deal? Well, to understand that, we need to understand a little bit about the captain. Uh, you see, the captain is, um, Captain and I get along just fine. He is a, a well-respected, highly decorated officer. He's been around for a long, long time, but um, he and I have really only a professional relationship. We don't, we don't discuss politics or personal stuff because uh, we disagree pretty strongly on, on some issues. And uh, Captain, um, Captain and I are both veterans of the first and second android human wars, or as he likes to call them, the wars of android aggression. And, um, you know, was, the second war was over a decade ago, but its feelings still linger. And um, there were good people, good androids on both sides of the war, uh, but the captain and I found ourselves on opposite sides, and uh, his side, his side lost. And then, in a lot of ways, I think uh, the captain just sees Charlie and I as being too different, um, not not appropriate. Um, we're, we can we can be good work colleagues, but to actually marry um, Isabella and Charlie, we're just we come from two different backgrounds, two different uh, belief systems, 
And so I think the the pain of those of his of his, of his war experience has really shaped how he how he treats Isabella and how he treats the members of this crew, uh, for good and for bad. You know, we're all shaped by our experiences. Um, even still, you know, he has the means and opportunity. He's obviously he's a military officer, so he could easily commit murder. He's got he got some some skills there, um, and you know, if if he was really concerned with um, maybe Isabella and Charlie, um, although to be that concerned, he'd have to be just almost insane. But you know, uh, that's my perspective. And again, we have we have two different philosophies of life. So perhaps he feels so motivated to control, um, to protect Isabella um, from the enemy that he would be willing to murder someone who is facilitating the relationship. So it's something to keep an eye on. Um, I'm a little hesitant to bring it up with him personally. You know, we, uh, Dr. Rush and I already talked to the captain. He was dismissive about it, maybe a little too dismissive now that I think about it. Um, but I, I, I'm not really looking for a direct confrontation. There have been several crews of his in the past that they're that reading the reports, you've seen confrontation, and they don't end well for the crew. So he tends to be a pretty heavy-handed leader, which in times of crisis is, is really beneficial and good, but uh, makes me a little cautious to bring anything to him until I have some solid evidence. So I'm going to keep investigating, maybe talk to Jimbo about my feelings, and see if uh, Master Sergeant Rush can help me out in transmission.